tell me when my time starts, I'll start talking. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> I actually, I'm more, more comfortable having a discussion than, than lecturing you for five minutes, although other people are very good at that. And I'd like to pick up on what they've done, but I want to give a very brief introduction to a report that I'm writing at the moment and then ask you some questions and get some feedback uh, as a way of illustrating the, the problem that I'm trying to deal with. And the report is tenderly titled Cross About Subsidies, the Equity Implications of Solar, in, Rooftop Solar in Australia. And it directly addresses this issue of uh, who pays and who benefits. Unfortunately, we don't have the budget to uh, employ excellent consultants like Lance, so it's mostly a desktop review and a kind of policy analysis. But we're responding to the two issues that have been um, getting a lot of media attention lately. One is what well, Lance said about high penetrations of PV going back into the grid, causing a lot of problems and costing a lot of money. And the other one is the concern of some welfare groups, and it was raised by the woman from origin earlier, that um, pe people without PV or DR in general are uh, effectively paying for these resources to be put in and not getting the benefits. So we've looked at the, uh, identified what the, what the, the, the problems are, um, looked at the extent of available information about the, the cross subsidies where they exist, tried to develop a kind of policy framework for determining how you work out who should pay where a material subsidy, cross subsidy exists um, and uh, some of the potential solutions. And I can go into what some of those solutions are very briefly in my last one minute. But before we get there, I'd like to ask you some questions. And the first one is, sorry Lance, who's got PV now? in the room. So uh, probably less than the national average of about, the national average is about 22% at the moment, 1.8 million households. Okay, second question, who would like to have PV, a battery and an EV in the garage within 10 years if the price is right? Pretty much 100%, great. So let's imagine it's in 10 years time and you've got all that kit. And, and say 90% of your energy needs, needs are being met behind the meter, or if you're on a microgrid, it's 100%. You're not using the grid at all. And at the moment, a third of your bill goes to the network. So let's say it's $500 on average around, around Australia. So do you think it's fair that in 10 years' time, with all that kit, meeting your own needs, you should still be paying $500 extra to the network? Put up your hand if you think that's fair. <laughs> well, that's... That's an interesting res result. You know, maybe a third of people think that that's still fair. Um, what if you then think about the fact that if you, if you aren't paying that $500, the way the market is regulated at the moment, the people who, the other two thirds, the, the people who, or depending on how many, let's assume that a third of you have all that kit, the, the two thirds that don't have that extra kit are gonna be paying an extra $500. <laughs> And it just still seemed like a fair thing to do. So we have a problem. But we also have potential solutions to this problem because if, for instance, you weren't just using the grid you know, every hot summer's day for a few hours, a few times a year, but you're using it on a daily basis for trading energy, for arbitraging your resources, or for um, adding voltage or frequency control services into the grid and getting paid for that, do you think it would be fair then for you to be paying the network to support those services? Can you put up your hand? Right. So we have a problem and we have potential solutions. My four minutes bell hasn't gone yet, so I'll start talking about the solutions that we've come up with. So the three, the three forms of costs that we've identified um, which need to be addressed are, first of all, government programs like the Renewable Energy Target and uh, premium feed-in tariffs and some of these solar and energy rebates. And the very simple solution to that issue, because a lot of those are paid for out of electricity bills, is not to pay for them out of bills, it's to pay for them out of government budgets. So that one we can take care of pretty easily, theoretically, even though it is a political issue well, that's more problematic politically. The second one is this issue that Lance mentioned about um, high bidirectional flows. And there are solutions that do not require a lot of money, like SA Power Networks is talking about the dynamic control of inverters, where the, kit, the extra kit to manage that problem gets put in smart inverters, and it's called VoltVar, and it's not expensive, and the consumer's responsible, or prosumer, responsible for it. 
and it allows them to not have any real throttling of their, um, their output even on um, the major big demand event days. So there are, that's just one of a number of solutions that are available. And the cost of them is, uh, in my estimation, looking at a few of the networks over the next regulatory period, less than 1% of total network expenditure. So it's not of great material cost. So it can be managed and there's a lot of scaremongering going around about those costs. The third one, which I, uh, w which I kind of um, got to with my questions, is around this issue that if we're paying less, if we've got DER at home, then somebody else is potentially paying more. And tariffs are the obvious answer to that. Charge everyone equally for their um, demand that they make on the grid during the peaks. Alternately, it, it does depend on how you price grid services. And the question is, are networks entitled to the same amount of revenue? We're assuming that the solar owners have been cost subsidised because we're assuming that networks are entitled to a fixed amount of revenue and maybe we'd have to think more dynamically about uh, how we price the whole grid. And I think in 10 years' time we're going to need a situation where, where we, we do have a much more dynamic, flexible um, uh, time and location sensitive method of, of pricing services to and from the grid, but we're not at that point yet. And in the meantime, in the short term, we've got some very simple cost-effective solutions for the immediate problems that we face. Thanks.